Well, um, everyone, we will go ahead and get started. And Carrie, you're our recorder, right? Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here um, this afternoon. Um, you'll notice that it says a supportive group discussion. So I'm really going to depend on you all to share um, because I can only know and refer to the things that I'm juggling <laughs> right now. You all know best what you're juggling and everyone on this call has a little bit of a different, um, a different, you know, um, burden that they're carrying and, you know, burdens and blessings. We can look at it both ways. We're certainly all, um, I think, you know, fortunate to do what we do and to, um, to have careers that we're passionate about. But I think for us and for many people right now, it's never been more demanding to, um, to be in education, K-12, higher ed, um, you know, all of the above. So we are juggling lots of things. I know I'm not the only one who's feeling overwhelmed and I do think this is a good time to talk about and focus on mental health and the, um, just the part that it plays in and how effective we can be as professionals. So we will get started. Okay, so um, I'd love to hear <laughs> how everyone feels that they're doing three weeks into the semester. Um, do you feel like the, the cat on the rope? Do you feel a little different? Um, anybody want to share? I'll get us started. Thanks. So, I, I'm still in my office working, which is not where I expected to be, to be honest. Um, <laughs> So that has been a ray of optimism that maybe we can pull through. Right. And I, I have found a lot of um, enthusiasm for my students and really recaptured that passion for teaching. And I really missed getting to interact with them. So that, that has been really reassuring uh, so far. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have heard feedback from my face-to-face -face students too, Courtney. They really are motivated to stay in um, a face-to-face -face or hybrid environment as long as they possibly can. Um, okay, um, I want to be sure that I'm saying your name correctly. Is it Ma Magali? Megali? Um, it's Megali. Megali, that's a beautiful name. Lack of motivation. Do you see that in your students or are you feeling that in yourself as well? I would say both because I am still doing my coursework um, uh, for my PhD. Mm -hmm. So I am a student too. And of course, I'm a teacher and juggling both has been very difficult because for me, I'm like the I'm the grown up, right? So I have to be prepared <laughs> and I have to be calm. Right. But for my own research and when I have to do my coursework, I have like no energy left. Mm -hmm. I just want to like sleep. <laughs> so, it does yeah. feel like even things that we're used to doing feel very draining, doesn't it, Magali? Right, right. Very simple day-to-day -day stuff. And mm -hmm. there's just so much to do because that has not reduced. In fact, it has increased, but your mm -hmm. energy is less. So yeah, there's a deficit that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing you. that. Darren, you're saying the semester has been like, my <laughs> gosh, kind of a comedy of errors then. Um, oh, yes, I, uh -huh. I agree with you very much. So we can think we're um, plugging along just fine. And then all of a sudden, something small happens that kind of, um, put, it's like domino effect, isn't it? Thank you both for sharing that. Anyone else want to share? Catherine, thank you. I'll go ahead and say that my favorite meme is the two possums on a tree branch. And one is saying, ah, and the other one is saying, ah, also. <laughs> That's, does that I, feel like you and your students? Does it, how to, who does that feel? Who are the two possums in your, in your meme? I think it's, I, I think both of those possums are, are, are existing within me, or perhaps it's, um, myself and a variety of academic friends. I literally two minutes ago got off a video call with 17 fantastic uh, seniors who are in my senior seminar. Mm -hmm. They are great, they are prepared. Um, I keep telling them out loud that I wish I could be there in person with them because mm -hmm. I do. Um, 
my 300 freshmen are driving me up the wall with mm. their emails and their mm -hmm. um, difficulty in following instructions. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be, I'd be curious to know if other uh, faculty and staff and PhD candidates and whatnot if others are dealing with that dynamic. And I suspect that part of that difficulty in following instructions may be, must be in part because so many of our students are overwhelmed themselves. Oh, absolutely. I was just um, sharing email back and forth, Catherine, with a colleague from HDFS and she is doing a hybrid. So she's teaching, you know, half of her class on Monday face-to-face, -face, the others are Zooming in half on Wednesday and then they're all online on, on Friday. And she said something that I thought would be good to share with the TLPDC um, team, that students are communicating to her that they are very overwhelmed by all of the different um, expectations, courses, and the platforms. So, so one time it's Zoom, maybe once, one time it's Blackboard Collaborate. I think some are using Teams. And we can feel overwhelmed with all of the things, but if we were taking, you know, four to five classes that all had a different platform or modality, I, I can imagine how. Um, and I know even in a normal semester, I will sometimes, you know, halfway through think, gosh, they know the attendance policy and I'll hear them say something like, oh, I had this confused with one of my other courses. I think right now it's so easy for them, don't you, Catherine, to blur, you know, the between what class, what, you know, what day, what modality, what, um, I don't know, so many different, all the things. <laughs> all the things, I'll, I'll stop here by saying that this experience, and we're barely in week four, can you believe mm -hmm. it, has really forced me to be even more patient than I think I already am. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. to be really, really patient um, and to, to bite my tongue and to not roll my eyes and to not get frustrated with them or myself. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. my piece for now. Mm -hmm. Well, and I have always considered myself or fancied myself a patient and a positive person, and this is testing me in both of those, you know, to, to remain positive and to stay, to stay patient and realize that, um, you know, I just try to remind myself every day, us as faculty and um, instructors, um, administrators, students, staff, we're all doing the best we can, aren't we? Um, but often I do feel like the, the cat on the rope here. So, um, so I have a, a graphic next that I, let's see. Um, I think we have to give ourselves some grace and, and remind ourselves that we're doing as well as can be expected given these, I hate to say the word unprecedented again, you guys, because I feel like that's all we hear. But it is true. We are um, we are in a circumstance that none of us have ever been in as faculty and as students. So I think um, how well we're doing has to be graded on a curve here. You know, we have to give ourselves a little bit more um, grace and understanding than we typically do. And as you said, Catherine, give our students of some some more of that as well um, so if you came to my last session and um, I did one a couple of weeks ago called beyond blackboard talking about and um, you know helping students be successful one thing I suggested is that for an introduction either online face-to-face -face or hybrid um, this could be a, a discussion starter um, so new discoveries in our new normal um, something called roses, thorns, and buds. So roses are good things that we've discovered or, you know, maybe unexpected blessings that have happened as a result of um, quarantine and pandemic. Thorns are things that we're completely tired of <laughs> and exhausted from. And then buds, things that we're looking forward to when um, some semblance of normalcy can um, can come back. So um, you all don't have to share, um, but I'd love to hear kind of what some of your thoughts are on, on this, because I do think there has been, um, you know, it hasn't been always pleasant, but there's been some growth and some good change through all of this. So I'd love to hear your, your feedback. Gosh, Emmy, yes. Oh, yes, you were in one of my other sessions. Stuck in um, Ohio, wanting to be in Costa Rica. That has to, that has to feel like a thorn right now. Right? I, I'm also brand new to Texas Tech, and so I'm just trying to get adjusted to all that at the same time. And I took a break from my PhD, but now the 
department chair I'm working for is pressuring me to finish the PhD mm -hmm. on top of all of this as well. So yeah. all sounds a little thorny. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Sure, I'll jump in for a second. Thanks, Darren. Um, uh, specific to the theater, I uh, work with inside of the theater, the school of theater and dance. Um, we we have the opportunity to see and experience so many more shows and things that wouldn't typically be available to us because everything has been moved online. Mm -hmm. um, so we can we have that option to to see bigger than where our geographical area was. So mm -hmm. that's been a really great thing. We've been able to see stuff coming from um, from China. There was a big uh, uh, festival done in Brazil that we were pieces of. So that side of things has been really great. Mm -hmm. the, the thorn on that is we've lost all of our in-person communications. So the, the act of the theater, the personal communication across the stage um, isn't happening as much. Um, mm -hmm. But the budding side of that is we're moving into um, the possibilities of uh, communal interactions through our web portals mm -hmm. um, with either um, polling and open microphone communications inside of a production. Um, so there's some exciting opportunities of what could come, um, but the technology is holding us back at this point. Mm -hmm. and the technology certainly ha has a lot to keep up with right now, doesn't it? And is being asked to do so many things. But you're right, it has in some ways opened our world, but in other ways closed it in a really kind of scary way, hasn't it? That's, that's a great perspective. Thank you, Karen, for sharing that in the chat, spending more time with my cat. I love that. Um, my dogs do love it when I work from home, especially because Wednesday was one of my work from home days and gosh, it was a cold day and we have a puppy. So he was really happy <laughs> not to be outside all day. Um, but I agree, Mongoli, um, I actually, when you say in the chat being tired all the time, I actually made an appointment with my doctor a few months ago because I was certain that there had to be something wrong. I was feeling so exhausted and physically no, <laughs> but we did have a long talk about how um, mental fatigue plays such a role in how we feel physically. And I, I don't know how many of you believe in, you know, kind of the mind body connection, but I have certainly felt a, that in a very real way through this, um, you know, we'll talk in just a second about anxiety and how it manifests, manifests itself in some really, you know, very real physical symptoms. Anyone else want to share? One, well, one rose. Oh, sorry, Suzanne. No, go ahead. Uh, it wasn't, it was kind of uh, one of those moments where we thought we wouldn't have been able to be there during a normal year, but my father-in-law had to have a heart surgery, open heart surgery in June. And normally that would have been really hard. And Missy, as you know, it would have been right on top of the performance mm -hmm. that our girls dance in. And mm -hmm. so it was a bit of a, a rose moment in that because things had already been shifted and so much of my work had been moved online that we were able to be in Kansas and help family a little bit through that. Mm -hmm. um, the thorn, I you, I was starting to type it, and then we, I've never had to take melatonin or any any type of sleep aid before. But mm -hmm. I just I I just have a lot of anxiety falling asleep at night because I'm thinking about all the things I should be doing. Mm -hmm. And um, I read an article the other day about how this is turning us into insomniacs mm -hmm. because like we that. just are constantly connected, and it's hard to turn off. And I'm glad others. I glad I'm not alone. <laughs> Yes. Um, yes. You've got a lot of, a lot of agreement in the chat. Yeah. And, and I find that I can, I'm so exhausted that I can fall asleep quickly, but then one o'clock, two o'clock, three, you know, I, I'm just checking the clock constantly. Yeah. So it's that not only falling asleep, but maintaining that good, long, um, you know, important sleep <laughs> that we need to re refresh and to recharge. Well, and the bud and the bud has been that my, my girls are back in school. And I will teach from my car if it means they get to stay in school mm -hmm. <laughs> because they need that so much. Yeah, Carrie, <laughs> Carrie's with me on that. Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm holding on to hope that brighter things are ahead. I think mm -hmm. that our generation, these, these kids, our children, will like they will have the grit, the resilience. Mm -hmm. they, they will be able to draw upon this and overcome if we can help them get through it now. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I'll confess, before all of this happened, I think my family was too, and maybe me professionally as well, I was too focused on the future and not in the moment. And this has been helpful to help our kids understand that, you know, we can make plans, but it doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> that they will always be, you know, because we were big or were our big planners in our house. And I like for them, you know, I, I'm sorry that it's been in this difficult way, but I do like that they're seeing that, you know, we really, we need to focus more on the moment that we're in and be excited and hopeful, as you said, for the future, but not so focused on it that we miss what's happening. Thank you. I think um, social media, um, television, you know, just that constant connection. I, you know, I think it has a lot, um, a lot to do with our lack of sleep. So, um, to, oh gosh, sorry. Um, the chat off here. So um, I just found this graphic I follow. Um, one of our faculty um, or instructors in HDFS, who's also a licensed professional counselor, some of you may know Dr. Paige Heiser, and she often puts really inspiring things on her social media. So this is one I saw the other day, and it made me think about how we've never needed each other and needed connection more, but that does feel like we are we're not exactly connecting in the ways that we normally do via screen. And certainly it's better than, than not being able to connect at all. But there, I do miss those moments of being able to sit across the desk from someone with uh, unmasked, and, you know, at a table having coffee and all of those things. So I think we miss that social support when maybe we need it the most. So dance here. Um, so new challenges that fall 2020 has brought, I think we all were in a fair amount of shock <laughs> um, during the spring and you know, adapting and quickly adjusting. And now um, I have here on the bottom a marathon versus a sprint. Um, I think I have been surprised and I'm sure most people have. I don't know that in March I would have believed that we would still be um, where we are. And I was just reading an article speaking of being connected on my phone and lucky that I didn't trip on my way from the College of Human Sciences. Um, just something that said the um, prediction is that by late 2021, we'll be back to normalcy. And when I think about that, that seems like a long, long time away. And so I thought, you know, as I was typing this, the mental reserves and resilience that it takes to you know, continue on and to continue and try to be positive and hopeful and productive. Um, those are, are big challenges. And how we have shifted both as professionals and in our personal lives and then um, how our students have, have shifted. Um, Suzanne, do you mind sharing, um, you've, you've told me kind of some of the um, struggles that your students, have, some of your students have shared. Um, I, when I, before um, Suzanne shares, I'll tell you all that I was surprised when we did roses, thorns, and buds in my face-to-face -face class that I just came from that two students talked about losing family members to cor the coronavirus, and one of them has lost two family members. So on top of all that we're going through right now, you know, reshifting and the new normal, you know, their, her family is in the midst of a of grief, you know, um, I, I don't know. I mean, of course, I, that shouldn't be a surprise, but it, it did shock me a bit that she has dealt with two family members over the summer passing away. Yeah, I've, I've had the same thing, Mitzi, where I've, I've had um, several students who have um, taken on uh, part-time jobs to help pay expenses for their families um, who've become caretakers for younger siblings because their parents were both ill um, with COVID, um, who've been sick themselves and had um, their careers as student athletes halted mm -hmm. um, because of consequences from the virus. I, I feel like I've seen a lot. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I do want to add one thing. Um, I love this metaphor of a marathon versus a sprint. And if, if you know me at all, you know that uh, our family is a, a running family. And so mm -hmm. these kind of metaphors really work for me. Mm -hmm. And I spent my morning at a cross country meet. Mm -hmm. and, and this morning I watched um, the junior high runners who are so precious and <laughs> um, clumsy and, mm -hmm. and just 
you know, like little baby giraffes out there, mm -hmm. clunk, 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 kind of running. <laughs> and um, there, I was watching the end of um, the the junior high boys, which that that particular age group is so awkward. Mm -hmm. And there were two little friends at the end of the race, and I happened to be next to one of the their moms, mm -hmm. and they they are in the last 500 yards. Um, they have run two miles, which is a long way for mm. those little fellows. And um, he got right to us and he went mm, like, and oh, started to, mm. and his mom said, you can do it. And he went and gave her a big, <laughs> while he's, mm. uh, and I feel like um, that is the story that goes with this slide to me. <laughs> We're trying to run it. this long distance and, uh, and he's, you know, not feeling great, but by golly, he's still going to press on mm -hmm. um, and, and finish. That's resilience mm -hmm. to me, and that's some mental reserve. So um, absolutely, I recommend that we all go watch a junior high boy yes. race because <laughs> they're pretty cute. <laughs> Oh gosh, what a great metaphor. And it's not that we're, um, or, or we're a life example, really. And it's not that we're not feeling the pain and the <laughs> nausea, <laughs> you know, all of, but just trying to, to continue on and not just for ourselves, but I love the fact that, you know, he, he was doing it for his family and, you know, for his coaches. And, you know, I do feel like speaking of juggling all the things we have a lot of, um, people depending on us, don't we? Do you all feel that way? You know, lots of students, your own families, colleagues. Um, not only are we juggling, you know, a lot of um, professional things, but a lot of personal things as well. So just maybe kind of reflecting. And then the um, new landscape of higher education, I think we all are probably thinking too, how will this change and not change? moving forward because the lessons learned I feel are going to stick with us in some ways maybe that will be more efficient and better and in some ways I think um, when we move forward we may lose some some great things that we've been used to before so just kind of that uncertainty in the moment and then uncertainty for the future of what our careers are going to look like and and all of those different things. Um, so, um, whether it's us or it's a family member or it is um, students, I think we need to be aware and I want you all to know, I don't think I am <laughs> giving you any of this information, you're not learning it for the first time. But as much as we're juggling, as busy as we are, I do think it's easy sometimes to, to play off symptoms as just tired or just this or just that when when they persist and they may persist persist if this is a situational um, struggle that we have and the situation continues on that we might need to seek some outside support um, so feelings of fear anger sadness worry numbness um, I wanted to talk about frustration not too long ago maybe a week or so ago I was I can't even remember what I was doing but I thought to myself something is just bothering me and I, I cannot put a finger on what it was and I never figured it out and I, I felt like I, I was a task that seemed pretty easy but I was getting really frustrated and in a way that I didn't remember before and you know thinking about the fact that that can have to do with feelings of anxiety and stress you know that something that tasks that don't always seem like that big a deal can become very frustrating very quickly um, changes in our appetite, energy, and activity levels. I know I speak just personally here that I wish my appetite was doing the opposite of what it's doing. Um, <laughs> I do seem to be self-comforting with food <laughs> more, more than I'm not lately. Um, difficulty concentrating and making decisions. So again, Magali, like you were saying, something that you know you have these demands and at the end of the day after you've taken care of teaching and other responsibilities, having difficulty concentrating is a real problem when you're a PhD student or, you know, in, in many, many different um, areas that can apply to. I think we've all said amen here to difficulty sleeping and um, maybe some nightmares or anxiousness. Um, physical reactions, headaches, body aches, stomach problems, um, 
I've su started suffering from migraines the, for the last few years. And I noted during quarantine that you only, if, you, if any of you are on migraine medication, you know that they give you eight or nine peel, pills, you know, in a prescription. And if you're using more than that, <laughs> then there might be <laughs> something going on. Well, when I was popping my seventh one out somewhere in the March or April, and it was, you know, late, but not quite the end of the month, I started to think, gosh, you know, this is, <laughs> this is a lot for, for one month. And I do think it was very, very um, tied to how stressed I was feeling. Um, if you have a chronic health struggle, maybe a worsening of that. And then of course, um, we've all read and seen reports and um, just different, um, maybe even different experiences with family members. I also had someone who I thought was very brave and transparent in my class say uh, Thorn was that her brother had gone back into rehab during, during the pandemic because he was really struggling to cope um, and that, you know, what an impact that had had on her family. So certainly if we have any type of struggle with, um, with addiction, it could, it could be manifesting itself. Um, and then again, this came from Paige Heiser's um, page. I love that it's just a, an image that shows that from our head to our toe, toes, we could be feeling um, the physical manifestation of the stress and anxiety that we're feeling. So it's, I, I, I just thought it good, good to make that connection. Um, so um, I, it seems even odd to talk about this, especially today. Um, the 19th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Um, it says here, the good old days when frequent flying was a thing. Um, I know, Courtney, you've had some um, abroad travel um, and that you're still uh, probably wondering if whether or not it will be impacted. Um, there are so many people I know, and probably many on this call, that used to travel very, very frequently, and all of a sudden that has just halted. Um, but when we did travel frequently, um, I know if you were like me, you probably had your headphones on or, you know, tuned out the um, flight attendants, um, you know, spiel about the instructions for the oxygen mask. But when we think about, um, you know, the stress that we're feeling in the context that we're feeling it, I think about the um, reference to, you know, securing the oxygen mask on yourself prior to helping someone who needs assistance. And, and, you know, the demands haven't changed, but if we don't make a change and try really hard to manage and not be afraid to ask for help when we're struggling, we won't be in a position to help anyone else if we're not, not taking care of our, our own levels of stress. So um, what can we do? So what, what are some things? How can we support ourselves? Because again, we need to put the mask on first before um, assisting others. And then also being cognizant that we may have not only students and family members, but colleagues who are really struggling, stu um, graduate students that we're supervising who may be really struggling. Um, so again, these are not new, this is not new information, um, but just kind of some good reminders. Um, has anyone struggled to um, take care of their health um, in ways except, uh, other than getting plenty of sleep? I know that I, I typically exercise most days of the week and there have been more days than not that I have skipped out on my daily workouts. Um, and that this is probably the last time that I should be doing that. Um, let me take a break here and take a look at the chat. Let's see, self-care is a struggle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that I was. I've been wondering about. We have. Uh, we purchased a um, an elliptical recently, only to find out that it was broken. So <laughs> I'm hoping that the part came in the. Um, Oh, oh, yeah, wow. the Peloton bike has saved my marriage. Um, <laughs> I joke, but my husband would go to the gym like every day mm -hmm. and he would teach classes at the gym. And so when the gym closed, I was like, you got to do something. You got mm -hmm. to. And it was expensive, but oh man, it has been, I haven't been to the gym since we got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. I suffered from, um, chronic pain uh, for a variety of reasons. And so I have to get regular body work. Of course, sadly, she's booked until mid-October, 
Um, mm -hmm. But a strange opportunity fell in my lap back in March when things were getting really tough just nationally. Mm -hmm. uh, I now have a friend, a four-legged friend, a horse mm -hmm. who has an absentee owner. Um, oh, wow. So I'm riding again. And it's so nice to be able to be outdoors. And when I am with my horse friend, um, I don't stress about anything. Mm. And that is very unusual for me. So that's, I'm grateful um, that that has dropped in my lap, even though it's an expensive hobby. Wow, that's great. And I, I know a lot of, um, you know, children and um, adolescents, even veterans, I've heard before, um, have, there's been a lot of um, good results from equine therapy. So um, I, I love that you're doing that, Catherine, and that you shared it. Um, injuries, um, fatigue, you know, we have lots of things that can keep us from moving, but um, if at all possible, it, it, I always feel better when I do, and every time I do, and then I, afterwards, I immediately think I'm not going to make the mistake of hitting snooze <laughs> and not going again, and yet I, I still do, so I'm, that's one thing that I'm going to try to do better this fall semester is getting that regular exercise. Um, I have underlying connection with others because so many research studies have shown that whether we're in a crisis time or just a normal, regular time, those connections and relationships over the course of our lifespan are what make us the most, make the most um, positive impact on our mental health. So honestly, just like we are doing today, um, maybe being vulnerable and sharing your struggles and your concerns with a friend, a colleague, a family member, um, trying to maintain, working to maintain those healthy relationships, even if it has to be via screen time rather than face-to-face. And just making sure that you um, build that strong and maintain the strong support system. And um, taking breaks and reminding ourselves that on really, really difficult days that those feelings will, will fade. Um, it's, that's difficult though. Um, and just to say, oh, everything will be better tomorrow. That sounds very trite um, because many times um, for, you know, long periods of time we can feel feel that sense of, of um, sadness and just anxiety. Um, breathing deeply, um, meditation, um, activities that we enjoy that, um, that fill our bucket, <laughs> as my kids always say. So whether that's being with people that you enjoy being with. Um, I, w one thing that I've really missed is I love to go to a movie in a theater. And that's not something that we're able to do. I've watched a lot of Netflix, but it's just, it's not quite the same thing, is it? And this, um, these next two are hard, you guys. Staying informed, but avoiding too much news. I'd love to hear if anyone has found a good balance with that, because I do feel a fair amount of anxiety if I don't stay connected to what's happening and what's going on, but then that comes with a price of feeling very anxious when you do stay plugged in. So anyone have a good strategy for finding balance there? Mitzi, I subscribed to a newsletter um, that does the top um, three to five things that happened for the day. Mm. It's like a digest mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't watch the news anymore. Um, and if you want to read more, it's like a summarized paragraph or just a, you know, a, a little bitty thing. And then there are links if you want to read more. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that really helped me cut down mm -hmm. all of the input. And if I have the energy, I keep reading or if it's something I'm particularly interested in. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, um, I, sometimes I delete the email and mm -hmm. I don't even open it up. But that digest version happened. I, I'll tell you, the name is not very nice, but it's really, it, and it's um, dependent on your political leanings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it um, definitely leans one way, so it, it may or may not be a good fit for you, mm -hmm. but it's called um, WTF Happened Today. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked, I like it, yeah. <laughs> but, but it, that is my personal opinion only. Okay, so I'm going to put that in the chat just so well, I, don't I know can if you type want to write it. that down. But <laughs> and so we can remember. Um, and have we mentioned laughter and how <laughs> how helpful that is? I love that. I love a clever name. Um, 
oh gosh, I love, thank you, Suzanne, <laughs> for so many reasons. Thank you for sharing that. I do think that's good. Some people put in the chat, like checking only twice a day, limiting yourself in some way is probably really helpful. And I know as much as I like to watch the 5.30 nightly news, it's not something I do as often because my kids are home and I've, we've got a 13 year old and a 16 year old and I want to be sure that I'm, um, you know, I mean, even if they're in the room and they don't seem to be paying attention, I was noticing the other day when I, I, I had a morning news show on and I was in the bathroom um, and it was in our bedroom and I, noted and I counted five times in about a 45 minute period that they said, um, we want to warn you, the footage that you're about to see is disturbing. And I, it just made me reflect when I was little, I remember hearing that once in a blue moon on the news and really tuning in. I was an anxious child and thinking, oh my gosh. <laughs> and you know, my mom saying, don't watch, you know, but now it, it happens multiple times in one newscast, you know, just how, how different. Um, and most of the time it is very disturbing for, for a variety of different reasons, not just related to the virus, but just other things that are going on that, that are very, very tough right now. Um, doing enjoyable activities that help us feel like we're returning to a normal life as much as possible and you know of course we can't maybe go to a movie or um, don't feel comfortable dining out right now but i um, figuring out ways i do feel like that is one rose i've seen whether it's picnics or drive-by birthday parties or you know things that people are still finding ways to connect and celebrate um, and find some normalcy um, and then seeking help when needed i think everyone on this call is probably a person who um, maybe in the past has considered it a badge of honor to be as self-sufficient <laughs> as you've been. And maybe even, I mean, I can remember when I was a classroom teacher years ago, bragging about how many sick days I had. And, you know, and we need to maybe get out of that mentality of not taking time when we're feeling physically ill or mentally um, like we need a, a break. Um, so distress and, and just noting how it impacts our activities, our daily lives, um, maybe keeping a journal. Um, that's one thing that I started doing when my headaches, I felt like we're getting out of control is kind of trying to write down and pinpoint, was I watching too much news? Was I eating something that was triggering it? And then just knowing when to seek help, um, talking to a trusted counselor, a doctor, a faith community leader, um, and of course, um, as we've said, supportive friends and colleagues and, and family members. And this is all information from CDC about taking care of emotional health. Um, and then um, talking a, a bit about our classes and our um, students and um, balancing that grace that we know we need to be giving right now and then still maintaining a high level of expectation um, because, you know, that. I think that is something that students want as well, um, that knowing what to expect and transparency and expectations. So flexibility um, and being willing to adapt course policies and assignments. I know prior to this, I had a, a pretty stringent attendance policy and students had three opportunities to miss and I didn't keep track of why. You know, they had, that could be illness, it could be a planned event, a wedding, a, you know, um, an opportunity to go to a concert. Um, but once those three absences were gone, their attendance grade dropped pretty dramatically with each one after that. So now um, I feel like, and I'm, I bet you all get these too if you're teaching a face-to-face -face or a hybrid, emails from students saying, I'm feeling this way, <laughs> um, a lit quite literally five this week. Do you think I should go to the clinic? <laughs> Do you think it's safe to come to class? And my heart goes out to them because I, I know they wouldn't be asking that if they didn't really want to know. And so then you're in a position where you're saying, I think you should, I, you know, and what I've said each time is if you're not feeling right, you probably should err on the side of caution and go and get checked out. And it probably is best not to come to class if you have a doubt, but then you find yourself crawling on the floor looking for the plug to the webcam. And <laughs> I mean, all these creative ways to try to get people plugged in and, um, you know, to be a part of your class. But 
you know, each time I've also received, and I bet you all have two feedback saying, thank you so much for helping me stay a part of the class. Thank you for, you know, that I feel like that reassurance that students are seeking right now um, comes with a lot of um, gratitude for the effort that is being put forth. So I think we should all congratulate ourselves for, for the extra care that we're taking. I do know that it's making a difference. Um, creative ways of working with students to help them be a part of our class when they have to be out for a period of time. I've never taught before where I had three people holding phones, um, FaceTiming someone who is out. <laughs> you know, we tried, we've tried FaceTime, we've tried Zoom, um, we've tried all sorts of different things and it's just a matter of kind of seeing what works best. Those open lines of communication. I think it's fair to say that um, us sharing that it's a struggle for for professionals, for faculty, um, gives the students a sense that we are authentic, that we're real, that you know this is not an easy time for any of us. Um, and it was fun a little bit in class to laugh together as we were, you know, struggling today to. Um, and I was I pulled a cord so hard that I actually actually pulled the mouse down and so then I was trying to use the stylus and all this is up on the big screen so I know they felt like they were watching their grandmother try to figure out how to work her VCR in 1983 or something like that but you know it kind of puts us on a, a bit of a level playing field doesn't it um you know students and we are struggling um and then all um someone in the chat a few minutes ago said all the emails all the follow-up required and i have found myself especially um suzanne and i are both teaching a section of rare ready um you know if you have a student who's not coming you know making a note whereas you know i hope that i was as good about following up before but it's very important now that if you're not in class and with these first year students to be sure that we're checking and then um if they say that they have been exposed or they're experiencing symptoms following up and making sure that they're reporting you know, through the, the right channels. All of those things take extra time. <laughs> um, and that's all in above and beyond. Um, and it, it just is, I wish that in this slide I had a solution and I hate the term it is what it is, <laughs> but in a way, you know, I mean, there's not a lot that we can do to get around the fact that it does require extra time, extra thought, extra energy. Um, any, any brilliant ideas on how we can can manage that besides just just acknowledging it I think is huge regarding the emails thing what I do is I just uh, created loads of different folders on my account mm -hmm. and so whenever I receive an email if it's a student or if it's a professor for me because I'm a PhD as well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just directly move that um, um, email to the folder. And then when I am feeling like I can check the emails, I just give myself like an hour, maximum two, and I just go through all the emails. And then I just shut down the, the Outlook because I have, I, I feel like I've married my phone because I have mm -hmm. seen the Outlook because I'm currently at, in Spain mm. and so I have like seven hours of difference between mm -hmm. like the, the time difference is huge. And so I struggled with the 24, 48 hour span window that I have to give my students mm -hmm. and my professors as well. So I think that I, that's what I do to just cope with it. That's a great strategy, Christina, and, and to, to time yourself and to be sure, you know, I've set aside this time. And I know we've all, again, fancied ourselves as multitaskers. And, but when you think about it, that scheduled time that you're focusing, you're probably getting much more done than when you are working on something, you hear an email, you answer that, you know, that, that one to two hours of focused time is a really, really great idea. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I tell students, don't be scared to send me a reminder email. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, and I just tell them, like, I don't mean to ignore you, but I, I've actually turned off all my email alerts. I just can't, I can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I do tell them if they're in one of my classes to put that in the subject line and I'll get to it much faster. 
Um, but I'm the graduate studies coordinator for the department. So I also have a ton of emails coming in on students wanting to go to grad school. And so it just helps me sort through them. I'm not good at the email business. Like mm -hmm. that's one of my not so great things, but mm -hmm. I try. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see a Catherine said, good for you, Catherine. I don't want them to think they're going to get an immediate response. So even if they email me, I'll wait a while mm. <laughs> to reply. Um, and so, and I'm, I'm blessed to have good TAs. And so my students, I've kind of trained them. Like if you want a better, quicker response, check with the TA first. And then if they don't know the answer, they'll get, they'll get a hold of me. They can text me. Mm -hmm. That's why I use the uh, send later function. I found that really useful. Oh, wow. um, that way they, I can answer the email immediately because I, as with so many of us, I have so much on my plate that the thing I worry about is forgetting something and leaving mm -hmm. someone behind. Um, so I'll draft it and send it several hours later so that they don't realize that they're getting instant attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Carissa, that's a great strategy too, that whether you're sorting them or spending time, focus time, that's that's a great organizational strategy. Um, oh, and Carissa, if there's a way that you can put in the chat um, some instructions, we'd love that. If not, I can make a note and follow up with. So my, my problem, once upon a time, I created a folder that said follow up. Guess what emails never got answered. <laughs> so I just leave them unread. And now, and every now and then I just sort for unread emails and then I'll reply to them. Because mm -hmm. not every email can be answered quickly. Well, yeah. and I have a tendency, I don't know if you all do this, I'll look at it on my phone and think, oh, that's not something I want to type on my phone. It's too long a response. And then that's how they fall through the cracks, Catherine. <laughs> As you were saying, you know, trying not to forget something. I've often read it on my phone and then it's no longer flagged. So that can be a problem. Teresa, you need to just do a session on how to save time in Outlook. Woo I will. I'll go for that. that um, sounds like a good idea. I I'll think tell that's going to be a TLPDC session, isn't it, Carissa? It, it could be. I'll tell you, this was the only thing that helped me survive when I was Blackboard support uh, because I had so many emails that came in. I had to be efficient and, and, uh, and using the category uh, feature was the, was, it's wonderful. No, I remember that, Carissa. You were the queen of that and, and did such a great job. Thank you. Yeah, Suzanne, I will do a session. We could do a 30 minute session. That would be, that would be so easy. Mm, you no. know, we're going to call you. So it would be so helpful. Yeah. <laughs> she said it out loud, that on my everybody. list to follow up too. <laughs> Perfect. Mitzi, I was going to say, um, I mean, I'm sorry if you've gotten an email from me that feels like this, but I'll admit it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I definitely cut, uh, copy and paste. Um, mm -hmm emails. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time on the first one. Like I, I have a COVID email now, you know, that I send to students who um, are either are exposed or test positive that I put a fair amount of time into in the first place. And, and now I don't have any qualms about copying and pasting that and, you know, maybe tweaking one or two details so that it feels a tiny bit more personalized. Um, with the volume of email that I get, I, it's a time saver to me. Mm -hmm. That's a great, that, I mean, absolutely anything we can do. And as you said, you know, it's, it's not impersonal because you have put thought and time into it, but to answer the, to type the same email so many times can, can get draining as well. So given all of these challenges, our circumstances, um, I don't know about you all, but I think one way we can help each other cope is just having these conversations. Um, this is it. This has helped me tremendously. Just to, it helps to know that you're not alone. Whether it's sleeplessness or struggling to keep up with the emails or um, you know um, just struggling with the technology, um, I think hope is something that we all cling to. That's just kind of human nature. So, how will our challenges help us? How can we come through on the other side of this, adapting, growing, and hopefully moving moving um, forward with with hope. So I wanted to, to talk a little bit about that. Um, so uh, anyone who knows me knows I love a good um, acrostic here acronym. Um, what I love, I love things that are um, easy to remember. So 
I, this, um, Courtney, the good news about not being able to sleep is I added this slide this morning after, in the middle of the night, I was like thinking more about the presentation. So I have a journal by my bed now because I've heard that you should write down what you're thinking about and then you can go to sleep. So it is true. I wrote this down and then fell back to sleep about uh, 3.34, some, somewhere around there. Um, so um, can I change my expectations to better match these circumstances? And I'm talking here, um, change them for our students and change them for ourselves. I can't expect to feel and be the person I was professionally prior to this, not right in this moment. I hope it comes back. <laughs> I hope that I don't still struggle for, to find the word or struggle with fatigue, but right now, I have to change my expectations for what a good productive day perhaps looks like. Um, it always it gives me encouragement. Our 16 year old son struggles a fair bit with anxiety. And one thing our pediatrician has told us over the years is helping him remember challenges he's overcome in the past. Um, so when he feels really stressed, just talking through, remember the time that you, you know, kind of that courage is being afraid, but doing it anyway. So we, we call it a conversation about the times that he's done it anyway. And it always does seem to help him feel more, oh, that's right, I did, I did do that. That was a brave thing. So just remembering challenges, although there's not been a challenge quite like this one before, we still can maybe draw on the strength of those challenges we've overcome. And um, varying my approach for a better outcome and um, approaching things, communication in a different way, or, um, you know, I, I have some students that um, I want to still work in small groups. And so I'm working online now. Can I um, watch Erica's um, presentation about um, Blackboard breakout rooms and, and try it in a, in a way it still is going to, um, it'll be different, but it's a way that you can still, you know, meet those same goals. Um, and is there an innovative technique that I can try? Um, just talking to colleagues and hearing about how they're doing things, um, being willing to come to sessions at the TLPDC at e-learning and learning about new techniques. I know there are times that we feel overwhelmed right now and learning something new, implementing something new on top of everything else. But if it's a strategy like um, Outlook categories or something that could help us be more productive, that's 30 minutes well spent and then we can, it can help us. And then what defines success for us right now, for our students, for ourselves, and how do we need to adjust that given the circumstances? Sometimes just getting through the day, <laughs> um, you know, being patient, remaining patient with a student, remaining patient with ourselves, um, getting half of our workload completed, half of our to-do list rather than the whole things. So for some days that I think that we have to let that be enough. I'm a big fan of Brene Brown. I've been, um, I've always loved her books and I've reread um, several over the quarantine. I love this quote, one day we will tell the story of how we have overcome um, this challenge and it will be someone else's survival guide. Like you said, Courtney, our kids are going to be resilient. Um, students, our own children, um, you know, just surviving this and coming out better on the other side will will give our uh, will hopefully give us strength and will will give others strength. So just um, kind of something quickly, since we're running out of time, practical something that we can maybe focus on and change. Um, I love what science says, speaking of Brene, she does a lot of research on what science says about gratitude and how it changes our physiology. So just a couple of studies from the UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center, and um, I'll let you all read this about expressing gratitude and how it um, is tied to our, our brain function. And then also a 2009 NIH study about how um, gratitude impacts our brain and our overall health. So some practical ways that we can um, maybe start to practice more gratitude. Um, keeping a gratitude journal, and um, that journal I have beside my bed <laughs> that I write things down when I'm stressed about also, not every day, <laughs> but I like to try to, especially if I'm feeling anxious at night, write down things that I'm grateful about. And there's something about writing it down that not just thinking it, but writing it down, that's really helpful. Um, telling a colleague, a friend, or a family member something that you appreciate about them, that 
that goes a long way. Um, focusing on the things you're doing well, it's easy for all of us to sit and think, well, that didn't go as well as I wanted it to. <laughs> I wish I could go back and change that, but maybe focusing on the things that you did do well, that you did accomplish. Um, writing someone a thank you note, I think that is tied to, to telling someone how, what you appreciate about them. Little things right now mean a lot, don't they? Maybe more than they've meant in a long time. Writing down gratitude thoughts, focusing on it, and a gratitude jar. Um, I talked about this even prior to the pandemic, and I had a class once that ended up giving me a gratitude jar at the end of a semester, and this has a place of honor in my office. It says, Professor Zigner, thank you for teaching us with such passion. We are grateful for you. And inside are some little notes that every student, and it was a large class, I think I had like 65 or 70 that semester, and they all wrote something that they were grateful that they learned. So when you have a really crummy class, <laughs> you can come back and remember, well, in <laughs> 2017, <laughs> I had a class that really learned a lot. I mean, it sounds silly, but sometimes um, it's those little encouragements. And then at the end of the day, reflecting on not just what went well, but remembering how it felt, what we accomplished. And I love the last one, who did I help today? Whether it was a colleague, a student, or a friend, who did I, who did I help to be better? Um, and then as we close today, how can we keep this conversation going? Um, I hope that it has been as helpful for you as it has been for me to, to talk about and know that we're not alone. What are some ways that we can support one, one another? Um, here at the TLPDC, are there resources that we could be helpful in providing for you? And is there a positive, practical change you can make in the coming days and weeks by the, like maybe a goal by the end of the month? So as you're thinking about that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a look at the chat here. Carrie, are you able to see the chat? For some reason, I can't get it to come down. Oh, there we go. Good. Mm, I love that quote, contribute more than you criticize. Mm, I'm so glad, Mungli, thank you for saying that. I'm, I'm so glad that it's been helpful. That was my, my great desire is that we would feel um, encouraged as we walked away on late on a Friday afternoon. And um, I love this last graphic. Um, Every day, today is a new day. I can be flexible, I can be realistic, um, I can work at a pace that is suitable for me. So old productivity right now, <laughs> we can't focus on that. We have to look at what's reasonable um, and celebrate the wins no matter how small. Even making a good food choice for me these days is a, is a win, so. <laughs> um, okay, so any final thoughts before? we close for the, for the afternoon. Thanks for doing this, Mitzi. Oh. I think it's, it's hard, those of us who are, you know, it's hard to always remain super positive and enthusiastic and uh -huh. we need to for certain mm -hmm. audiences, but then we need to get real when we can. Mm -hmm. And get real with people who understand where we're coming from, right? Well, I'll, I'll take a, 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 just a tip from my own list before I want each of you to know I feel so fortunate to work with such fantastic colleagues all over campus. When I hear what people are doing and how they're adapting and coping, it really inspires me. And so I feel like I'm just grateful and really fortunate to work with each of you. Thank you for making time to, to be at this session today. I wish you all the best. If we can help at the TLPDC, please let us know. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.